What are you doing? You said if I wanted to buy or sell a house in Central Florida that I should follow you. On social media! You got a link? Buying or selling a home, visit CelebratingFlorida.com or follow me on social media. Facebook, YouTube, and Parts Unknown. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got something special today uh, for people listening to the audio version. We are going to release this as a detour episode on the uh, Grand Circle Tour podcast. And we got a special guest today, David. Oh, you know what I mean? Name Bossert. Bossert. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It. Thank you. You got it. You got it, Stan. Keep going. I got the first one. I got the first one ever. Right on. He pronounces everybody's name wrong, Dave. Yeah, it's, it's actually an honor if I pronounce your name wrong. Uh, <laughs> so we want to welcome Dave to the show. So Dave, you have a long, long history with Disney. I don't even. I'm afraid to go into it. You started <laughs> off as an animator, a pickup. What were you? <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 uh, I started in early uh, 1984 uh, at uh, uh, the Walt Disney Studios in the animation department, which is now known as Walt Disney Animation Studios. And uh, I started work on the Black Cauldron. That was my first picture at the studio. So do you remember what, what you actually were you animating for Black Cauldron? Oh no! I I started out like at, at the bottom of bottom of the ladder in what is known as an in betweener position in the effects department. Uh, so that it, it's an entry level position. That was my first uh, feature film in the industry, uh, and that's where I started. And when I finished the Black Cauldron, about a year or so after I a little more than a year after I started working at the studio. Um, I uh, got bumped up to animator on the next project, which was The Great Mouse Detective. Oh, wow. Nice. Also also known as Basil of Baker Street, yeah. which was the original title. Uh, I love that but, movie. But, but it was released as uh, The Great Mouse Detective. My daughter, I think, watched The Great Mouse Detective 500 times. <laughs> wow. Was, <laughs> that was wow. The, her movie. That was her movie. Are you sure it wasn't $4.99? Yeah, it might wow. have been. It might have been 499. Yeah, that was that was her favorite. Uh, Lily saying she loved the Black Cauldron. Uh, Mary saying Stan I, can't pronounce his own name. And, and, and by the way, you know, I I think uh, I think the Black Cauldron is is an underrated Disney animated film. Um, oh, it I, think is. We, I think For people sure. should watch it. Um, you know, uh, when I was at the studio, every so often I'd arrange a screening of the Black Cauldron in the theater. You know, at lunchtime or at the end of the day, and it was always standing room only because there were so many people who hadn't seen the film at that point. And this, you know, I'm talking like in the late '90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There were a lot of people at the studio who hadn't seen it, and uh, you know, I think there's a lot of great uh, aspects of that film. But uh, you know, what can I say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, our, our, everyone in our chat is saying that they love the Black Cauldron as well. It's yeah, it's, and, and, and you know, and, well, I, and, and I'll just add to it that I think that the Black Cauldron suffered from it. It, it was a transition movie. It, it was a transition from one management team to another management team. Michael Eisner, Frank Wells, Jeffrey Katzberg came into Disney Studios as the new management regime. And, and the Black Cauldron was pretty much almost finished at that point. And, and typically what winds up happening when, when there's a management change out is that, you know, they, they don't want to deal with what 
was with the old group. They want to deal with what's new and what they're going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there's an incentive not to, not to have something that was already in production become very successful uh, because of obvious reasons. And, uh, and so I don't think the film was, uh, was really supported as well as it could have been uh, in its initial release. But again, I think there's a fan base for Black Cauldron out there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and you worked in one of my favorites of all time is Roger Rabbit. I I adore that movie so much. Yeah, you know I I uh, you know I'm often asked the question, "What's my favorite film?" and and, and that's really like asking somebody who their favorite child is. You know, <laughs> you you love all your children, and yeah. I and I love all the films I worked on, and each one holds different memories for me. But 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 Who Framed Roger Rabbit bubbles a little bit to the surface of all of that from the standpoint that I got to live in London for a while. And I worked on that movie in London with a very international crew of artists. And I made a lot of wonderful friends who are scattered all over the world now. And, and that's really what's, uh, you know, so memorable for me. I mean, it's a great film and I really love it. And I think, you know, this year is the 35th anniversary of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And it still, it still holds up really oh. well. Uh, considering it was a film done pre-computer days. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I just think that, uh, uh, you know, being able to live in London, making all those new friends, and uh, and it was sort of an adventure. It was kind of cool. It was the first time I was out of, out of the uh, United States, and uh, so it holds a lot of fond memories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to do our two segments. Uh, really quick, and then we'll we'll uh, get back with uh, with Dave and, and his stories. We want to hear about his books. We want to hear about Small Rock Prod Podcast. Uh, one of my, one of the, I don't listen to too many podcasts, but it is one of the ones I do listen to. Yep. Uh, I listen to ours and I listen to that. That's so it's funny. unprecedented. The two hosts of this podcast <laughs> listen to my podcast. <laughs> actually, actually, oddly enough, uh, a Skull Rack podcast. I noticed you have Jimmy Mack and uh, his Wendy, his wife Wendy Schneider, do a lot of the voiceovers. Yeah, and Rebel Force Radio is the other one I listen to. Ah, okay. So the uh, first time there I was listening, you're like, hey, wait a minute, I know that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying to sound somewhat professional. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking about somewhat professional, here's our professional, we got a brand new segment. Uh, we introduced it last week. This is our second time ever doing it. Where in the world is Victor Naraki? Where in the world is Victor Naraki? Now, is that professional or what? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let the uh, chat catch up before uh, Dave and Chris do some any, any guessing as to where we oh, are. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, we'll see if anyone. I think this is in both Disneyland and in the Walt Disney World Park. Oh, I see Hidden Mickey in this picture. We could have done a Hidden Mickey here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is uh, Elmer Bernstein's score as a standout? That must be on yes, that. I, I I think Ken Ken is referencing uh, the Black Cauldron. I agree mm -hmm. with you, uh, Ken. And he and Ken also put up a note uh, uh, just a few moments ago uh, about Gergi being his. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, Gergi uh, was a great character. Hendel Butoy uh, was the character animator that worked on uh, Gergi and did a lot of the Gergi animation in Black mm -hmm. Cauldron. And Hendel went on to. Uh, uh, co-direct on, uh, I believe it was the rescuers down under. And then, uh, he was the supervising director on Fantasia 2000. And I had a great opportunity to work with him. Uh, he was a really great person. Uh, he actually, uh, by the way, uh, uh, is teaching at, uh, Southern Adventist university in Chattanooga. Really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. There you go. Little little tidbit for you. Yes. So the uh, guesses are coming in on uh -huh. the uh, on the uh, where in the world is Victor Naraki. And uh, Ken, as usual, guesses Ratatouille. <laughs> he guesses that every <laughs> single week. It doesn't matter what picture we put up. It could be yeah. Cinderella Castle and he'll guess Ratatouille. Uh, uh, Caleb got it right away. Mickey yeah. Minnie's One Way Railroad. There we go. Uh, for the people listening to the audio, you can go on YouTube. You can see the picture there. But... Uh, 
That's uh, Caleb got in there first, and then Mary got in second. Mickey the directional Mary. signs that say Merry Go Round, Fishing Hole, and Yensid Valley. Yes. And, you know, and in case you guys didn't get it, I would have zoomed out a bit, of course. <laughs> oh, keep zooming out. Let me see. Let me see what kind of is that. Is that as, oh, that was as far as it goes. That was, that was okay. as far as I went. Yeah. Right. Right. By then. <laughs> and that, of course, is brought to you by Disney at your doorstep.com. If you're looking to move in or around the Orlando area, contact Victor Naraki at Disney at your doorstep.com. He's the realtor you want to have on your side uh, if you want to move near the magic of the Magic Kingdom. All right. Uh, let's get into our. Our next segment, really quick here, and then we can, uh, it's the MEI in the details. And I got a kind of a cool detail here. This is brought to you by MEI Mouse Fan Travel. Uh, Vicki and her team, of course, will set you up for any uh, Disney Universal uh, vacation. I actually booked them when I went to Disneyland Paris. So in California Adventure, there's a billboard sign advertising the California Limited train. Uh, of course, we all know Walt's love for trains. And at the bottom of the billboard, there's three cities listed, Chicago, Kansas City, and Los Angeles which of course would be the major hub stations where Walt would have lived mm -hmm. moving to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And that's, this is kind of a tribute to the cities that Walt used to live in or the train stations he would have taken to get to wherever he was going. Mm -hmm. It's a really cool detail Imagineers put is. in. I like that. Yeah. And it's the type of thing most people wouldn't catch unless you're kind of, you know about it or you're looking for it. So next time you're in California Adventure, did you know about this one, Dave? You know, uh, not not off the top of my head, but I know that when I go to the parks, I'm always looking at the details mm -hmm. because there's always hidden stuff. Absolutely. There's all kinds of, you know, even on signage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a nod to things. Uh, they're very inventive with this, and I love it. Mm, yep. Yeah. You like too. We always, we always say, look up, look down, look all around. Uh, you're going to see details. If, whenever there's a number, like I remember being in, in uh, Disneyland and there were some numbers on some crates and I'm like, what are these numbers? So I kind of kind of looked at them and said, oh, this is when Disneyland opened. This is when Star Tours opened. This is when... <laughs> and there was like, uh, they all lined up perfectly. Uh, that is, a, Ken says it's a cool detail for sure. Oh, Craig Skaggs. Hey, Craig. hey, Craig, welcome. Craig's a Disney artist. Uh, he's uh, uh, one of the master artists. Oh, I, 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 the name sounds familiar. I yeah. don't know if we've ever met, but hello, Craig. Yeah, the uh, actually the, the his his icon there, the ratatouille is his. He that's his painting. I, I nice. love that ratatouille icon. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. All righty. So, uh, where are we at? So we, we were talking about your career. Uh, you did uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, you've been all how many movies all together? Uh, I want to say I have 32 or 33 theatrical credits. Wow. Uh, and then there's a, a bunch of television, uh, credits as well. And, uh, I, I couldn't tell you how many of those, cause some of that stuff, like I worked on Ren and Stimpy for four and a half seasons. So I've, I've lost track of how many episodes that was in the four yeah, and yeah. a half seasons. Yeah. But, yeah. So. But but it, 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 you know it's it, 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 I think it was a very varied career, um, and then there's and there's some uh, there's some credits uh, that uh, I didn't actually work on the movie, but it helped support the movie, uh, okay. doing doing some special projects things. Uh, so like uh, for Frozen or Big Hero Six, you mm -hmm. know. So and so. When you say you, you you worked on on these, how how does that like was there a favorite? That's like asking me if my uh, who's I my know. favorite child. Well, you said that already. Yeah. Come on, I mean, like, man. Roger Rabbit kind of pulls <laughs> to the top. You know, Roger Rabbit pops to the top, but you I know, think Dark also, Cauldron probably holds a close place to you in your heart. Yeah, I mean, Black Cauldron because it was my first picture at the studio. I you know I I have, I have a, a soft spot for that. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some fond memories from that film, uh, but I have fond memories from all of the films. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, working 
uh, on uh, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had uh, fun uh, working on uh, The Lion King. Uh, I did a little bit of work in Los Angeles on Lion King, but I also spent six weeks in Orlando working on The Lion King when it was in production. Um, uh, Pocahontas is another film that I have a lot of fond memories from and I really mm -hmm. enjoyed working on. Uh, Fantasia 2000. Uh, you know, Fantasia 2000, I spent uh, close to five years working on that project. Uh, and I got to become very good friends with Roy Disney. Uh, I, uh, you know, I worked on a number of other projects with Roy after that. And, uh, and, and as you guys probably know, my, the first book I wrote was Remembering Roy, uh, which I wrote, wrote after he had passed away. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's been a very varied career, uh, and and it's been a, a fun one. And the ride isn't over yet. I mean, I'm uh, I'm I'm having I'm having a ball. So you have these two new books out. The um, sorry, I didn't write them down. <laughs> the Nightmare Before Christmas book and the Tomorrowland book. Did you work on the Nightmare Before? Christmas? Yeah. So so what I what I've told everybody is that uh, I have a credit on Nightmare Before Christmas as a snow animator. And I did just a little bit for that movie. They needed some help. And I jumped in with a, a software engineer named Trin Huang. And the two of us created the snow for Halloween Town in that one sequence where it snows in Halloween Town. Um, and, I, and I really emphasize the fact it was a small part of helping out because... There was a dozen character animators who did the bulk, you know, almost all of the animation uh, in The Nightmare Before Christmas. And I, I think it's important uh, to recognize not only them, but the work that Henry did. You know, Henry Selleck's the director. A lot of people who are fans of The Nightmare Before Christmas think Tim Burton did The Nightmare Before Christmas. <laughs> It, Tim came up with the concept, Tim did the character designs, and Tim produced the movie. But Henry Selleck is the guy that put the vision of uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. He made that movie uh, as the day-to-day -day director on it. And, and I think that, you know, I always want to emphasize that. Uh, and also the music by Danny Elfman. Oh, um, fabulous. You know? So, and, and, and in the book, it's called Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, visual companion, the book is really a behind the scenes of how this film got made and, and, and why it's so successful. I mean, I try and talk a little bit about that in the epilogue of the book, which I refer to as the afterlife of the film. Uh, and uh, really, it, it, it's a celebration of all of the talented artists and craftspeople and animators uh, who really made that film what it is today. And, and you know, when, when a film comes out, you hope it's going to have legs. You mm -hmm. know, that, yeah. that's industry speak for that. It's going to run for a couple of months in the theaters and make a lot of money. Yep. But, you know, Nightmare Before Christmas has had the longest, longest, luscious legs of <laughs> any movie that you can think of because 30 years on, the film is still... You know, the, the, the fan base expands every year. Yep. And, the, and the kids who saw the movie in 93 when it was released to theaters, they're, they're taking their kids today to see the film. Mm -hmm. And whether that's on Disney Plus or when they do special screenings like, you know, I'm going to be at the El Capitan tomorrow night in Hollywood with Don Hahn. And, you know, it's uh, it, it's really to me uh one of those great movies that kicks off the holiday season you yeah. know and and some people refer to it as being a cult classic uh and i would say no it's a holiday classic it it, it falls into the bucket with uh, miracle on 34th street it's a wonderful life mm -hmm. the chuck jones uh the grinch who stole christmas the half hour animated special uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas special, mm -hmm. the Rankin and Bass stop motion, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and uh, mm -hmm. Frosty the Snowman. Uh, you know, that those films to me are really 
the holiday films that you want to see every year. And I do. I've been, I've been watching the Charlie Brown Christmas special for better than 50 years. I watch it every year. It's, it's a staple. Uh, and the nightmare before Christmas to me is so wonderful because it took Tim's two favorite holidays, Halloween and Christmas and mashes them together. And I feel like, you know, tomorrow night when I'm at the El Capitan watching uh, Nightmare Before Christmas on a big screen in 3D, and I'm going to be like, okay, we're into the holiday mode. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm going to walk out of that theater and say, okay, you know, Thanksgiving will be here tomorrow and Christmas is right around the corner. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I watched it the other day with uh, with my wife and my daughter. And uh, my daughter said the same thing. She said, wait a minute, because afterwards we watched the credits. He goes, this wasn't directed by Tim Burton. I says, no, it wasn't. And she was shocked. And so you, you're absolutely right. Everybody seems to think that Tim Burton directed it. Uh, no, and, and, and it really, you know, uh, every time I talk about the book and the film, uh, I just want people to understand that Henry Selleck is an incredible uh, director. Uh, you know, last year he had Wendell and Wild out, uh, which was a stop motion film, but he's also did James and the Giant Peach. Mm -hmm. He also did Coraline, which is really one of my favorite stop motion films outside of uh, Nightmare Before well, Christmas. Well, I mean, well, it's just well, absolutely fantastic films that, that uh, Henry has done. So uh, it's just, you know, I, I think he deserves his due. Speaking of stop motion films, uh, a friend of yours, I guess, just came up with The Eventer. And I'm trying to find it in the theater local near me, and I can't find it anywhere. Yeah, you know what? I really it, want to see that. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate because, uh, you know, it was in the theater. It only opened in like seven or 800 theaters nationwide. And, and it was only there for maybe a week or two, and it just disappeared. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's a shame because it's such a beautiful film, and I really highly recommend it. I, I think if you keep your eyes out, it's going to show up on one of the uh, streaming services uh, at, at some point. Uh, and, and I just highly recommend people watch it. And I, I, I do believe it's going to get a little bit of uh, uh, awards buzz at the yeah. uh, end of the year, and the beginning of uh, the new year. So Well, it, it might pick up legs just like Nightmare did. It could. It could. It could. I hope it does. It, it sounds yeah. amazing, just from the way you and, and – yeah. uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was that you were on with. Uh, uh, well, I, I had uh, Al John on. Uh, and, uh, and then we had Jim Capabianco, the, uh, writer director on. Yeah. 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 I really want to see that one. Uh, I just, I'm looking at the, uh, at the chat here. Uh, Mary has a, has a good one here. Though the stores agree with you, plenty of Christmas available to buy out there. I know. <laughs> it's I, know. Halloween yet. I, I know it's kind of criminal. I think that when you start to see, uh, Christmas, uh, decorations or, or Christmas themed stuff in stores in August, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, I, I just kind of feel like I don't mind seeing Halloween stuff popping up in, in, in late summer. Uh, mm. but you know, come on, hold off on the Christmas is, is Chris, Christmas stuff until right after Halloween. How's that? Yeah. You know? yeah November 1st, it should be. Yeah. Uh, we lost Chris. She just messaged me uh, saying the cats disconnected her. She'll be, they were going nuts behind her. <laughs> yeah. I saw, I saw them flying around back there. <laughs> her and her cats. Uh, so I was so I was watching the Nightmare Before Christmas, and I did have a question. So there's an opening shot with Sally, and her hair is kind of blowing, and I couldn't really tell if that was stop motion or if that was animated. As far as I know, it was stop motion. Yeah, it, it looked stop motion, but I'm thinking it could have been a really good animator. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, 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 I think I think it was probably stop motion. It was part of the puppet. But, uh, you know, there was a little bit of 2D effects animation done uh, mm -hmm. when, when you see uh, uh, Jack burst in the flames at the, while he's singing I Am the Pumpkin King. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was a 2D animation that was done by a uh, uh, really talented uh, artist, Gordon. I'm trying to remember his last name now. But anyway, he'll probably shoot me if uh, if he's watching this because I can't remember his last name. There was, <laughs> but, there was a lot of like smoke effects too. Gordon, ba I'm sorry, Gordon Baker. There, I got Gordon it. Baker, I, there we go. I saved myself. <laughs> uh, there, was, there was a lot of uh, like smoke effects. 
that had to have been 2D, I'm guessing, or added? Yeah, uh, you know, the those kinds of things like the fire and the smoke, uh, those were put in after the fact, uh, yeah. you know, which you have to do when you're doing stop motion. Yeah, that's a, that had to have been, because uh, as I was watching it, we were kind of trying to pick up what is 2D, what is stop motion, what is, uh, there was a fireplace at one point that, I'm thinking that was an actual fire and they green screened it or something. Yeah. I, I mean, that kind of stuff, you know, it just gets put in afterwards. Um, and, and, you know, again, they tried to do as much as you possibly could uh, on set uh, yeah. with the puppets, but there's certain things, you know, when you have a character, a stop motion character jump up into the air or, you know, jump through the air where they're not touching the ground, you have to have a rig that's holding them in place. Uh, and so that rig has to be removed after the fact. Uh, mm -hmm. Those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Chris, did you have a... Uh... Are you still there, Chris? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you, were, if you were still with us or not. No, I'm here. Okay. I'm just bringing up uh, a couple of photos here. Yeah, and I honestly, I want to show live and in... Yeah color this beautiful book i just got mine in the mail the other day and um i have quite a few of dave's books in my collection Many and thanks. he was nice enough to send me um oh you got oh yeah you, yeah you've got the book plate in there yes okay. the book plate he sent yeah. me one for several of my books and autographed all of them so that was so kind of you and, and, and by the way anybody who has uh, any of my books if, if you go on my website davidbossert.com um there there's a tab uh along the top that says free stuff and if you if you click on that, there's a little pull down menu and you have three choices. You have uh, book plates, bookmarks and coasters. And so just go to the bottom of the page and follow the directions on sending me a, a stamped self-addressed envelope uh, and with a note of what you want. And uh, and I will get it back to you, hopefully in a reasonable amount of time. It was I, very I will, quick. Yeah. OK. I will tell you that I, I went to the mailbox today and there was something that had been mailed out earlier in March. I, no, excuse me, earlier in October. So uh, that's on its way to uh, the person who wrote to me. But, uh, you know, I'm happy to do that because I know. Uh, you know, when there's book signings and, you know, I'm doing a bunch of them in Southern California, mm -hmm. you know, there, you know, if you live, if you live in the Midwest or you live up in New England or down in Florida, and you, you know, uh, but you want to have a book signed, just write, write to me through my website and, uh, and I'll be happy to send you a signed book plate. And then you can peel the back off and stick it right in the book. Yep. Beautiful. Very nice. And that's at davidbosser.com. You can, you can get that. Yes. Uh, this was one of the effects that I was re wanted to talk about too. The the lighting on Light Nightmare Before Christmas was absolutely amazing. Uh, like this is a real shadow, obviously not animated afterwards, and it's all due to the lighting team. Yes, and and the, and the thing I will say, uh, and kudos to Henry. Uh, Henry Selick really wanted to uh, introduce uh, you know live a live action filmmaking into stop motion. And, and that was, you know, moving camera and, you know, lighting and creating atmosphere. Uh, and, and I think he did a fantastic job on it. Uh, there were, there were really no restrictions, if you will. Uh, and, and so every set, you know, they, they had, they had a lighting guy, uh, they have a cinematographer. Uh, and so they set these things up. Uh, and before they actually animate the scene, they would do a pop through is what it was called. And a, and a pop through is like doing a pose test. So they might pose the puppets every, you know, 10 frames or every eight frames uh, going through the action that the puppet would be doing in that particular shot. And they would look at that and then they would do a second pop through that's maybe every four frames and they'd really get a sense of, you know, how they were 
going to animate this, the, the whole shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and each one of those tests was, was reviewed by Henry and the animator. And there were, you know, any notes were given, uh, you know, the animator would then apply those notes to the next version of the scene. But typically they did uh, one to two pop throughs per shot before they actually animated the shot. Hmm. Yeah. And then here was the, oh boy, is it not? Oh boy. Why is this not moving to the next? There we go. There this is. is the scene I was referring to with the fire in the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that looks so real. I'm thinking that had to have been a real fire green screened in later or something. Yeah, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure how that was done, but uh more than likely it was put in after the fact. Oh yeah, it was definitely put in after the fact. There's no way it was stop motion. Yeah, the, it does. It the, looks the, so uh, real. <laughs> the characters, but yeah. Yeah. But it's really cool when you watch the movie and you kind of look for these these different hidden hidden things throughout the whole yeah throughout the whole movie like, like what's animation what's two D unless you don't want to you know ruin the porridge or whatever you want to call it <laughs> uh, Caleb saying he loved that that Joe Ramp was the story supervisor and voice of Igor in Nightmare Before Christmas yeah a lot of people don't realize it but Joe Ramp was an uh, incredibly talented guy and uh, he he did improv and uh, he did voices uh, he he's the voice of uh, I think it's Heinrich the uh the little caterpillar in uh ants uh, uh, not ants in the bugs life bugs life yes yeah, Bug, yes. Bug life. yeah little little char char character called heinrich uh uh joe did the voice for that character too and 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 by the way you know joe joe died uh prematurely in in a car accident and so there's there's a uh, a little tribute to to joe in the book as there is for an artist that I went to Cal Arts with named Kelly Asbury, who was one of the assistant art directors, and also uh, John Barry, who was really one of the uh, top stop motion animators who worked on uh, Nightmare. Uh, he passed away in 2000. So, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure that I did these little tributes to some of these folks uh, uh, who were, you know, significant in their contribution to the film. And, and certainly Joe was. And there's some wonderful quotes from Tim Burton, uh, you know, reminiscing about Joe uh, mm -hmm. and, and Joe's involvement. Yeah, he was very, very talented. Yeah. Uh, Mary's asking, can you explain the uh, stop motion versus 2D? Sure. So, so 2D is, is where you're drawing on paper, essentially. So 2D animation or traditional animation, as it's called, uh, is hand drawn on paper. And then uh, the paper is either scanned into the computer or in the old days, like on Pinocchio and Snow White, uh, there would be an artist who would lay a piece of acetate over the drawing and then draw that, you know, trace that drawing onto uh, the acetate with ink. Uh, and then the reverse side of it would be painted. So that's 2D animation. You know, typically, if you look at Snow White, Pinocchio, Bambi, um, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, um, uh, you know, Lady in the Tramp, Jungle Book, 101 Dalmatians, those are all hand-drawn traditional films. Uh, and uh, stop motion is where you have a three-dimensional set. And on that three-dimensional set, you have three-dimensional puppets, uh, you know, physical puppets that you can hold. And those are animated one frame at a time. So, you know, if a, car if a, if a puppet is moving, it's, you know, you're moving one leg for a frame, then you move it again, then you move it again then you're tilting down and you're moving the next foot and you're creating that walk cycle. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's literally a, a physical and, a, and I'm getting something off of my desk. It, it, it's literally a physical three-dimensional puppet, mm -hmm. you know, that you can then animate. So, yeah, I think a really good example of, of stop motion would be the ADATS and Empire Strikes Back. We're all done yeah. in stop motion. Yeah, and, and uh, also uh, RoboCop. Um, yeah, you know those those were stop motion. Uh, uh, 
you know, the old Gumby and Pokey show uh, was stop motion. Davy and Goliath. Oh, Davy. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that that that's the difference, you know. Yeah. And then and then, of course, the third is is uh, is 3D or CG computer generated mm -hmm. animation. And that's essentially all done digitally. Yeah. Your story stories and whatnot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So you sent us some photos here that I, I think are from the uh, from the book. Oh yeah, yeah. This is this is one of the, the uh, what they're doing is they're injecting latex into a mold of uh, Oogie uh, Oogie Boogie. Uh, so this is this is the creation of the Oogie Boogie uh, 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 you know puppet. And it was at the time the one of the largest uh, stop motion puppets that had ever been done. Uh, so yeah. here you've got this plaster mold uh, that's all uh, you know tied together with uh, typically you know really uh, rubber bands, uh, but industrial strength rubber bands, and they're injecting uh, latex into that mold. So if you go to the next picture that I think I sent you, there you go. So they've pulled the mold apart. The, the, on the, the right side of the screen, uh, you've got one half of the mold mm -hmm. and, uh, and on the left, you have this guy pulling, uh, the cast puppet. Uh, the cast puppet body out of the mold. Now, the difference between Oogie and the other puppets, the other puppets were like solid foam, but Oogie was so big he couldn't be solid foam. So what they did was they they made it like he's hollow inside. So if you go to the next picture, I think it shows, yeah, you can see the side of Oogie is open and they actually put his armature in and then they filled it with these uh, fiber balls, like giant cotton balls, oh, wow. to, to give him, you know, the girth uh, and the solidity, so that you know when he was on set, they could they could tweak his uh, armature uh, and not sort of collapse the the uh, latex outer coating of the puppet. Right. Right. I wondered how, how they did it. I just figured it was yeah. like an armature inside like a sack almost. But yes, it was latex. Yeah. So so this is this is the only puppet that was was created that that was filled like this. Hmm. You know, where whereas all the other ones when they cast them, it, it can't they, they would lay and I don't think I sent these pictures, but they would lay the armature into the mold. They'd put the other half of the mold on top of it, tie it up with rubber bands. So it was really tightly together. Mm -hmm. And then they'd inject the foam, the, the liquid foam rubber into it. And when that set, they pull the pull the mold apart and they pull this puppet out. And I, I there might be a picture that I show you, I send you a picture of of one of the puppets where it had a, uh, the rubber flange. No, uh, no okay. I think it's the next one. Yeah. OK. Do you have you don't have that one? or you do? I don't think so. OK. I might not have said that. Yeah. No, but I, I I do want people to know that there are some bookmarks uh, oh, you just okay. showed. There there were some bookmarks uh, for uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, which you can only get from me, the author. Um, and by the way, I do want to point out, it says introduction by Tim Burton. <laughs> well, Tim, Tim had, there was a placeholder um, uh, introduction in the book and uh, it it vanished, uh, and they didn't get a, they didn't get another one from him to to put in the book. Oh wow! I'm not, I'm not sure why, uh, yeah. but uh, they when the book showed up, I I didn't notice it right away. But anyway, the bookmarks were made before that, and uh, there you have it. So ah, okay. <laughs> it's collectible. Collectible bookmarks. It's a collectible gonna... bookmark. But anyway, so. Uh, yeah, the pictures in this book are just absolutely <laughs> You don't beautiful. have to kill us until we see these books. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, yeah, one of the things I sent you, there, there's a wonderful two-page spread of fan art uh, that's in the book. And, uh, and I, I 
you know, in the afterlife chapter at the end of the book, I really talk about how this is not just a film, but a film that's gone uh, out into the world and just keeps expanding with fan art, with uh, fan tattoos. Um, and mm -hmm. we, we have a two page spread of, of fan tattoos. And a lot of folks had sent me uh, sent me pictures of their tattoos to, to mm -hmm. hopefully be included in the book. And I will tell you, I got way more uh, tattoo images than I could possibly put in the book. I mean, I could probably do an entire book of, of Disney <laughs> nightmare tattoos. Here's your next so, book. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. I wonder how many people watching would like a book of uh, Disney ta tattoos. <laughs> Now this picture here, the, this is this is the core team. There was a dozen animators, and I I want to point out the young lady with the red uh, red shoes on uh, in the front row. That's Angie Glocka. She was the only female animator uh, on the Nightmare Crew. Wow. Uh, and when I interviewed her, I asked her why there weren't more women in stop motion. And uh, and she had a really interesting explanation. Uh, she said when she was growing up, she always was in the in her father's shop helping him, and and, and she was very comfortable using power tools and drills and and all kinds of stuff like that, and uh, and had no problem with it. And when you're doing stop motion, it's very much a very physical, uh, very demanding uh, craft. Uh, because you're you're moving a puppet, you're actually physically moving a puppet, and that puppet has to be anchored to the to the stage, you know, to the set. Mm -hmm. uh, usually involving drilling a hole, putting in a screw to screw the the foot to the to the set, uh, and then as you're going along, uh, filling those holes so they don't show up. Oh wow! Uh, you know uh, when. When, when they're not in use. So, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's much more physical. And I think she sort of attributed to that, to the fact that that's probably why there weren't as many women at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure there's many more now, uh, mm -hmm. especially with all the advancements and the various equipment uh, uh, advancements uh, to, to make stop motion a little bit easier to do. You know, yeah. her uh, um, your interview with her was fascinating. I yeah, she, really she's, she's a wonderful it. person. And by the way, uh, I'm trying to see if you look in the photo, the so directly above her, there's a guy with long blonde hair. Mm -hmm. Right. And then behind him, that little head back there, that redhead guy, that's Owen Clate. He was one of the other animators. Well, Owen and Angie are married. Right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I like it that she's holding Sally's leg that I'm assuming was the one that Oogie Boogie was teased with and went to the Yes, team. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, uh, the gentleman with the flaming red hair on the left side of the screen, mm -hmm. uh, he's got the black shirt on. Yeah, that, that's Paul Barry. Uh, and uh, he, while he was working on Nightmare Before Christmas, he had a short film that he had done in the U.K., um, called Sandman, and it was nominated that year. I think this was 19, I want to say it was 1992 or 1993, but his short film was nominated for an Academy Award, uh, and Tim Burton sent him a big bottle of champagne uh, and a lovely note congratulating him uh, while he was working on Nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So, But I, I interviewed a, a, a fair bit of uh, the animators. In, in the center, uh, in the, uh, between the guy with the pink shirt, yes, right mm -hmm. there where your cursor is, that's Eric Layton. And Eric uh, is uh, or was on Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, the supervising animator. Oh, he, okay. he was the guy in charge. He was the he was, I believe, the first animator that came on to uh, Nightmare Before Christmas after Henry took over as director. Mm. He looks like uh, the youngest one in this group. Yeah, but boy, I mean, incredibly talented guy yeah. and very gracious. 
he was working on a film in England uh, at, when I was writing the book and, uh, and we were able to do a, a Skype uh, call uh, while he was in England. And I did a whole interview uh, just over Skype with him. And I think this was before Zoom became the thing. Mm. You know, uh, but uh, all of these guys were were really terrific. Um, got a, uh, just invaluable information from them uh, uh, in, in uh, terms of you know their process and how they went around making the movie, went about mm -hmm. making uh, the movie, and mm -hmm. um, and a lot of them are quoted in the book. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Well, and here we, here we go. So here's so here tattoo. here's. Here's some of the tattoos. And, uh, you know, again, it was really a hard choice uh, to, uh, you know, pick out which ones we were going to use. Uh, the, the three calves uh, that you see down at the bottom right there, uh, that, that's actually uh, somebody I worked with, a colleague at Walt Disney Animation Studios, Vinny. Uh, oh, wow. Vinny, Vinny Diamor. Uh, and... And that was he had he had sent me that it's sort of a turnaround of his one leg, mm -hmm. uh, so you could see all the characters that were on it. Very uh, cool. Yeah, so pretty wild. Craig is saying, "I hate that I can't do any nightmare paintings for Disney." I guess as a master artist, he's limited. Well, I you know something it, it's it's kind of out of my hands. I, I oh yeah, I, sure. I, <laughs> I have no idea who's who's handling that stuff now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you can see that one in the upper middle. Uh, it's like a whole sleeve on wow. her leg. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty wild. That is crazy. Yeah, Ken is saying the tattoo of Jack and Sally on the left was beautiful. Uh, yeah. Um, this year there's been so much nightmare before Christmas merchants. Is this year the thirtieth, the thirtieth anniversary? Correct? Yeah, today's the third. I mean, this year is the thirtieth anniversary. Yeah, yeah. But but believe it or not, earlier today I was actually at Disneyland and I went into the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas gift shop right over in New Orleans Square, uh, and I actually went in to see if they had a copy of my book because I wanted my wife to take a picture of me with the book in the mm -hmm. shop because they have so much cool nightmare uh, merch in there. And I went in, I couldn't find the book. So I asked one of the cast members, I said, do you have the Nightmare Before Christmas book? She goes, oh my gosh. She goes, we're sold out of it. We're waiting for more inventory to come in. <laughs> I was like, darn it. But I was like, ha I was happy it was sold yeah, out. Yeah, yeah that's, really. That's good Damn, you know, that's fantastic. Wow, so. yeah, that's awesome. So so this is this is a great image. This, this is actually, if if you had a pair of 3D glasses like I do here, uh, <laughs> you'd be able to see that that head in the in the middle that's Tim Burton's head uh, being used as a hockey puck. Uh, <laughs> but but the scene was reshot with a pumpkin, and that's what's in the movie. Oh, and, wow. and sort of after they had done this uh, scene. Uh, there was, I think Henry was a little apprehensive in showing it to Tim initially, wasn't sure what the reaction was going to be, but I talked to Tim about it when I interviewed him for the book and, and, you know, Tim, Tim took it, uh, I think, uh, in stride and, uh, you know, kind of you know, him being an artist and an animator himself, you know, he gets it. Uh, yeah, he, he totally, he totally got it, you know, and I, th but I think it's really kind of fun and we included it in the book. That's awesome. I Not believe, in three D though, by the I way. That was I think I, I think I sent you the wrong picture, but anyway, <laughs> you get everybody gets the idea. Yeah, yeah. I'll use my uh, glasses from the three D National Parks book. And there you go. There you go. <laughs> Absolutely. And you, and you can go back and watch this on YouTube and pause it there and yes. see yeah. it in three D. <laughs> there we go. But but you know it it, it really is a a, a wonderful uh, send up for the movie to really be able to. Uh, talk about the genesis of the film, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how it started, give a little background, a little backstory uh, on Tim and how Tim got into the business and his early years at Disney, uh, and then his meteoric rise as a director. Uh, and then uh, also um, uh, to be able to shine a spotlight on all the talented people who were involved in making the movie and, and to tell that story in, in, in the uh, production order. Mm 
if you will, mm -hmm. of how the film actually was made. Uh, and, and I was very fortunate. I got to spend uh, a lot of time with Danny Elfman uh, talking about each of the songs that he wrote uh, for the film. Because when you, when you listen to the 10 songs, it's really an operetta. Uh, each song tells a portion of the story and propels the story forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it wouldn't be the film it is without Danny Elfman's music and songs. Yeah. The, the one, the one song, like being from, from Winnipeg and growing up even North of here, we always had snow for Halloween. So watching Nightmare Before Christmas, seeing Jack, who's a Halloween guy being amazed by snow, we have snow every Halloween. How do you not know this? <laughs> that was the one thing that I always like. Like, what is he talking about? There's no snow. There's always snow for Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to that. Yes. Uh, I wanted to talk about Old Meal Press. Yes. So, uh, uh, Old Meal Press. yeah, you know, Disney Editions published The Nightmare Before Christmas Visual Companion and has published a number of my other books. And the Old Mill Press has also published uh, a bunch of my other books, too. So, um, you know, uh, I've, I'm in the enviable position of having not only The Nightmare Before Christmas Visual Visual Companion out uh, in uh, in stores and all over the place. In fact, you know, I've had a number of people send me pictures of them holding my book or with my book at Barnes and Nobles. Uh, somebody sent me a picture of themselves in Jackson, Mississippi. Somebody else in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. So uh, if you happen to be in a Barnes and Noble and you want to send me a, a photo of yourself with my book, I'd love to see it. Uh, but but uh, I also have uh, the House of the Future, Walt Disney, MIT, and Monsanto's Vision of Tomorrow. Uh, and that uh, book is officially releasing to uh, the public on Tuesday, next Tuesday. Uh, and um, there, the, the book is, there's been a bunch of copies sent out to people who pre-ordered author signed copies through mm -hmm. the Old Mill Press. So uh, folks can still go to the Old Mill Press and, and order a, um, a House of the Future book, and it'll be a signed copy. Uh, and for just you guys, just you people who are listening, if you use the code FRIEND5, there it is on the screen, FRIEND5, you get $5 off. So instead of $60, it will be $55, and it'll be signed and there's usually some extra stuff they throw into. Yes. So, as you well know, Chris. Yes, I know that very well. <laughs> so that's at, at the Old Mill Press. At the Old Mill Press dot com. But you know, if they want to do, you know, if they want to go to their local bookstore, and I always encourage people, you know, if you have a local bookstore, an independent bookstore, support them. Uh, they can they can go and order the book in if they don't have it in stock. They can easily order it and they'll have it in a few days for you. So so try and support your local bookstore if you can. The online retailers, you know, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books in a Million, uh, they they're all carrying it. Um, and I will tell you, Barnes and Noble apparently loves Nightmare Before Christmas because they stock up on everything Nightmare Before Christmas every year. Yeah. Uh, this time of the year. So that's why a lot of these folks around the country have been sending me pictures of themselves in Barnes and Nobles, um, you know, with with my book. So, yeah. so uh, let's let's just touch on this House of the Future book a little bit. We're going to like yeah, bump up against we're, time we're as have you back on. on your podcast. <laughs> there we go. There it is. But, yeah. the, um, house of the, the, the House of the Future. Yes. Walt Disney, so, MIT. It's a beautiful book. And I will tell you that this book is just chock full, if I can show you, Here just absolutely chock full of photos, uh, uh, stuff people have never seen before, Okay. So there's just a ton of information in here, and I'm super proud of the book. I wrote it because I never got to see the House of the Future. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I wanted to attempt to do is create an immersive experience in a book that would at least give people who never saw the House of the Future the sense that maybe they have mm -hmm. experienced it without physically walking through it. 
And those that had seen it, it'll bring back a flood of memories for them. Yes. And if you want really detailed information, the Skull Rock podcast, the last episode that came out this past Monday, yeah. um, you can listen to Al John interviewing Dave about the book. I know. It was kind of surreal. I was a guest on my own podcast. <laughs> it was craziness. Now, it was a I, wonderful interview. Yeah. It was so interesting. I just, it's like, I didn't want it to end. I wanted you to keep talking. You so, know what? I love Al John. Al John's my brother from another mother. <laughs> uh, and, you know, he and I just have wonderful conversations. So I love it when he gets to interview me. And by the way, he's going to interview me also in a couple of weeks about my Nightmare Before Christmas book, oh, too. Good, yeah. good, good. And, and you know, each, and by the way, each of these interviews that I do with different podcasters, the interviews are different. I tell different stories because. Mm-hmm. You know, like you guys are asking me interesting questions that other podcasters haven't asked me because they've asked different questions mm-hmm. themselves, you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. each of these interviews are, I, I think, are really kind of fun and different. It's not the yeah. same old stuff. Yeah. Uh, we have a comment here in the chat. Uh, Caleb is saying not to be on not to be on topic, but I want to thank you, Dave, for sharing my Disney history in my Futureland Adventures Facebook group. I truly appreciate it. Oh, fa- Fantasy Land Adventurers Facebook group. Uh, yes, I, yeah. I actually try to tag. Um, you know, when I when I uh, I post, I, I usually post on Mondays who our guest is on the Skull Rock podcast on my social media channels, mm-hmm. and then on Tuesdays I go back to the post. And and then I uh, I uh, share it with like twenty different groups out mm-hmm. there, uh, and you know I do it with you guys, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and I do that because sometimes when I put a post up on uh, Facebook, their algorithm will say, oh, he's promoting something, and we're not gonna let we're not gonna show that to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So you know some of those posts, you know, like fifty or sixty people you know, uh, like it, uh, and, uh, and other posts, I have hundreds of people liking it, you know right. what I mean? So, right. it, it, so I try to share it with, with the groups that are, are most interested in wanting to do it. And the fantasy land adventures are, are one of the Facebook pages I, I mm-hmm. post to. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on. This was an absolute blast. I wish we had more time to talk about the, uh, the, the MIT, future house of I, it's a long well, time we, we, we have, we have the, back on for yeah. a third time that's yeah. all we, we got an unprecedented third yes. time <laughs> <laughs> or you could come on the solo show my other podcast that's been on that many times and that's craig so oh, there you go all right yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but yes thank you so much dave and um dave said that he would Go in with us on doing a drawing or a raffle or however we want to work this out. Um, and he is going to donate one of his House of the Future books for one of you lucky people that will win. And then he will send it out to you. So we will work out those details. Um, and it'll and, be signed. We'll get it'll, be a si- it'll be a signed copy. Yes. So... There Very you nice. go. Something Very to nice. look forward to for our GCT listeners. So we'll bring that up on next week's podcast. So yep. listen to next week's podcast and we'll have uh, a, a clue. You know what? Why don't we just do it now? You want to do it now? And yeah. people can message us what they what they want. But they, I'll give us cute code word. Message us the code word and you're in a draw. How about that? Yeah. Does that sound good? Sounds yeah. fair to me. Sounds good. Okay. So the code word is Friend five, which would give you the five dollars off old meal if you go to oldmealpress.com. Sorry, the oldmealpress.com. Uh, you get five dollars off the book. Message us friend five and you'll be in for a drawing for the book. Yes. And one of you will be lucky enough to win. Yeah. And as and as soon as you guys send me the person's name and mailing address, I will make sure that a book goes out in the mail to them and they might even have it next week. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll 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 do the draw next week live on the air. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll do the draw next Thursday uh, live live on the show. Awesome. Uh, uh, you know what? I just so everybody knows, if you do the draw next Thursday, I'll be on a plane flying out of the country. So okay. they're going to have to wait an additional eight or nine days before they get their book. Just so they know. Just Message good. us in Facebook Messenger to the podcast group. Yeah. Okay, not here. Do it. Hey, in Chris is getting messages already. <laughs> Do it in Facebook Messenger to the podcast group and, you know, the friends of the GCT podcast. And then we will take all those entries and pull a name. Right. Awesome. Uh, we, got, we got to wrap this up. Uh, yep. Chris, what happened on the Transical Tour podcast this week? Were you on? Um, this last week, we did our tips for beating the heat in Disney parks because we all know that we roast when we're there. <laughs> and we have another um, episode that we're going to record, not Sunday. We're actually going to be doing it on Tuesday. And we're going to be talking about tips for first-time visitors to Walt Disney World. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good awesome. One. And then Chris joined me on the solo show, and we uh, wrapped up Ahsoka series. We did yep. talk uh, episode seven and eight of Ahsoka. Have you uh, seen those yet, Dave? You know what? I'm I'm I have to catch up. I've I've watched half of the Ahsoka uh, show. Okay, and you're going to really be blown away. It, but I I I've got to finish watching it. I know they've all dropped now. Yep. Uh, so absolutely, okay. no uh, no uh, spoilers yeah. for Dave. Yeah, no spoilers, no spoilers to me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, don't listen I've to said, this. I, by the way, I've said right that. I've said the same thing to Al John. Don't spoil yeah, it for no me because Al John's on top of it. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's one of the things I love on Skull Rock Podcast is, is, is you guys talk about what you're watching. Yes. Yeah. You know, it. believe it or not, that that's one of the more popular segments uh, of our podcast. I can't tell you. Last week, I was at the Disneyana Expo in Anaheim, uh, the Disneyana uh, Fan Club Expo. And I had so many people stop by and say, oh, my gosh, I love listening to the Skull Rock podcast. And I really like hearing about what you're watching mm -hmm. because I found some real gems that mm -hmm. I didn't know about, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like and I watch a, really an eclectic array of television shows when I can. Mm -hmm. And so I try a lot of different things and I like watching shows from uh, England, you know, UK. Uh, I like watching shows uh, that are, are shot in Europe, that are in English, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, in, a, as well as shows, you know, from North America. Uh, there was a great show I was watching that was shot up in Nova Scotia. Mm. I'm just oh, saying nice. that for Stan. Yeah. Stan, nice. Stan just realized, hey, that's part of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, surprisingly, we're becoming the Hollywood of Canada here because movies are being filmed here all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, we uh, will have Dave back on again as soon as we can get something worked out with him to talk about this other book. So Yeah, yeah. I really wanted to – I know nothing about the, the uh, tomorrow. Night. Oh, we could have a whole – long discussion about oh, it and, you know, there's a yeah. lot of fascinating aspects of it so i yep. hope you have and maybe in november or something yeah 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 craig is saying we have to have dave back want to know here much about his projects <laughs> yeah some yeah november for sure we'll have yes. to back on. uh steve who's a friend of ours who's blind he says wouldn't it be funny if a blind guy who can't read win the book <laughs> What can I say? I mean, I, you know, I think it would be fantastic, but you know, I, I would hope that maybe he has like one of those special readers, you know, isn't there, isn't there like a, a, a thing you can, uh, you know, uh, wipe over text that, that then translates it into voice. Or you could just get his wife to read it to him. Yeah. Oh, just okay. That's probably <laughs> easier. <laughs> Getting frequent guest jackets made up. Yes. <laughs> there we go. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, Dave, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It was uh, an absolute pleasure having you on. Uh, I finally got a chance to meet you. Stan, Chris, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll be giving you guys a shout out next week on the Skull Rock podcast. Okay. Sounds great. Stay safe, everybody. Okay. Have a good night.